So we're in the middle of studying uh, Sefer Tanya, and we're, Mitzvah Hashem, going to complete the sixth parak this evening. The sixth parak, which is dealing with the second of the two souls that were given to man. Man was endowed with both a Neshama Elokis and a Nefesh Bahamas. And in the sixth parak, the Alter Rebbe is trying to explain to us some of the difficulties that we run into, some of the issues that we sometimes face when we come into contact with the beastly side of man. So we've spoken about the Ten Crowns versus the Ten Spheros, and we've spoken about how the mind wants a certain thing, and based on the godless hamochin or the katnas hamochin of the individual who is wanting something, who is in love with or who is angered by or finds pride in a particular thing, how that's deeply affected by the mind and how on the side of the sitra achra, on the side of uh, lack of purity, so we spoke about how sometimes the desires of the heart can affect what the, uh, what the mind wants as well. It goes in both directions. Let me explain the beautiful teaching from Rav Nassim Breslover, how the seven lower attributes sometimes give birth to an understanding of the world which is not really in line with reality, but more in line with the way I wish reality was. So we end the chapter with... Uh, a discussion of the fact that just as in Machshava, Dibor, and Maisa, in the world of Kedusha, when a person thinks something holy, speaks something holy, does something holy, the mind, mouth, or body part that engages in that activity becomes enclosed with a certain divine quality. So the same thing is true in the Hefech of Kedusha, and the opposite of Kedusha. Alter Rebbe says, "Ve'eser bechinos elu." These ten spheros or ten crowns of impurity. Eser bechinos elu hatmeos kisha adam machshev behen or medaber or osa. When a person either thinks or speaks or acts using one of these ten capacities, hare machshavto shebemocho v'diburo shebepiv v'koach ha'maasi shebiadav v'shar evarav nikram levushe misavu. Just in last week in the, in the Haftorah, we were talking about Yoshua Kohen Gadol, a very Hanukkah dik uh, Haftorah, that Yoshua Kohen Gadol was dressed in dirty clothing and the Malach came and took off his dirty clothing. The Alter Rebbe is telling us that when a person acts, speaks, or thinks in a way which is not refined, which is not holy, this is called Levushe Misavu, dirty Malbushim, which cover the hand, or the heart, or the mouth, or the mind of the person doing that activity. <clears throat> At the moment that a person is engaged in that thought, in that speech, in that action, that body part is enclosed in a dirty garment. Says the Alter an amazing thing, that what are the dirty clothes that can cover the guf, the body of a Jewish person? We're talking about something as simple as going to work out at the gym, having a snack, taking a nap, mowing the lawn. Any action which is described as tachas hashemesh, some action which is described as being beneath the sun, is a dangerous activity. And we're going to explain what this means, obviously. It's not the first time we're sitting together. If this was the first time, I wouldn't be speaking like this. That when a person is engaged in something which is tachas Hashemesh, some activity which is not lamalim and Hashemesh, something which is not metaphysical, which is not beyond this world, when a person engages the mundane, so he must begin 
by saying, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Sha'akol Nia Bidvar. Now we know that that's true when it comes to taking a drink or eating something. But what we're going to learn tonight is that before a person presses the start button on the laundry or turns on the flame to make dinner or folds the laundry after it comes out of that remarkable machine that does it for you or gets on the train or gets on the bus or turns on the car ignition, any act which engages the physical world, which is not an overt one of the 613 mitzvahs is not Torah in a very overt sense, it needs to be preceded or needs to be brought out in Kedusha by tefillah, a thought, a speech, some act which transforms this mundane action into something which is going to elevate me and the object that I'm engaging. Otherwise, hakol hevel veraos ruach as the Zohar says in Parshas B'Shalach, Tviru Derucha. It's a breaking of the spirit. It's a breaking of the spirituality of the person. V'chein kol ha-diburim v'chol ha-machshava asher lo la-Hashem. And similarly, not just in the world of action, but any speech, any mundane talk, which serves no purpose, or a thought, asher lo la-Hashem hema, which is not to bring kavod to Hashem. Ulertzono, ulavdaso or to Hashem's divine will, which is to have a dira b'tachtonim, to be down here in the physical world, ulavodaso, or to serve Him in some capacity, to bring honor to Hashem's name. Any of those things is tviro derucha, is a shattering, a breaking of the ruach. Now, the Alter Rebbe is a very demanding Rebbe, and we remember from when we first started this journey, that the Alter Rebbe defined for us that a benoni is a person who never makes a mistake. The only reason that he's not a tzaddik is that he's still fighting to make the right decisions, as opposed to the tzaddik who's on autopilot to serve Hashem and who is so deeply in tune with what Hashem wants that for him there's no fight, there's no great existential battle that goes on every single time. He has to decide whether or not should I get up for davening? Should I sleep in? Go to the later minion? Should I not go to minion at all? Should I have this meal? Shouldn't I have this meal? But Sadik knows to trust his instinct and that when he wants something, it's coming from a place of holiness. But is he going through that process all the time as well? Of, I'm putting on the stove, I'm taking my kid to gun. Vada. He's like, yeah, but it sounds like the bane on it has to do that prep. Pep talk before the act, before the action, but the tzaddik is just like in it. So the <coughs> the Alter Rebbe in later chapters talks about different levels of tzaddikim. Mm. You know, certainly those who are familiar with stories of the tzaddikim, the Talmidim of the Baal Shem Tov, know that they spend plenty of time doing hachanos and going to the mikvah and davening and preparation. And yeah. <coughs> So the first thing, just to take a step back and to realize that the Alter Rebbe is being very demanding of us, but as we mention all the time, that when a person wants to hit something high, sometimes you have to aim even higher than your destination so you can... There's uh, two teachings from the Baal Shem Tov, both of which uh, I think are important to study before we get into the main point of what I want to talk about tonight. One is based on the Pasuk in Tehillim. The Pasuk says, Ashrei Adam lo yachshav Hashem lo avon ve'ein beruchor remiyah Simple translation of the Pasuk. Ashrei Adam lo yachshov Hashem lo avon ve'ein beruch Praiseworthy is the man who Hashem does not think about this person any, there's nothing faulty. There's no avon, there's no sin that this person uh, has done that Hashem is thinking about. Ve'ein beruch There's nothing rotten inside of this person. Bashem Tov very cleverly uh, Explained the Pashtus, actually more Pashat than the what's considered to be the Pshat interpretation. As Bashem Tov explained, and it's recorded by his grandson, Degomachan Ephraim. What I heard from the Admor, the Bashem Tov Akadosh, 
On the Pasuk, Asher Adam lo yachshov Hashem lo avam. Praiseworthy is the person that Hashem does not think about this person, any, any fault, any sin. Hainu, what does that really mean? Hainu. Shehu tamir bidveikus v'machshavto v'ashem yisbarach. That this person is so constantly wrapped up in divine thinking and divine consciousness. Ulakach keshenofo v'machshavto rega echad ve'enu machshiv v'ashem. When a person, for a single moment, loses focus and ends up not thinking about Hashem for that one second, nechshav lo avam. That's the sin for him. I can tell you with some degree of certainty, about myself at least, that when there's a moment when I'm not 100% focused on the master of the universe, halavai that I should be on a level that Hashem looks at that and He says, Weinberg, what's your, what's going on here? There's so many other problems. There's so many other problems that the fact that you know my tie isn't exactly straight. I don't wear a tie. The fact that my tie isn't exactly straight is not what Hashem's looking at. So the Pashant have explained, Ashrei Adam, praiseworthy is the person, how fortunate is the person. Lo Yachshav Hashem, that that person, when he doesn't think about Hashem for a second, not that Hashem's not thinking about him, Lo Yachshav Hashem, in the moment that he doesn't, he's not tuned in sharply to a divine consciousness, Lo Avon, that for him is considered a sin. Ashrei Adam, Lo Yachshav Hashem, praiseworthy is the person who's on such a high level that just not thinking about Hashem for a single second, Lo Avon, that's a sin for him. And this is what the Alter Rebbe is basically saying, that any time a person's thought, speech, or actions are not built la Hashem levado, are not completely wrapped up in Hashem, that's what's called, and that's what we're going to develop, that's what's called sitra achra, the other side. That's what's called the other side. Ashrei Adam, if he's able to live in that level. Ashrei Adam. Here's the other teaching from the Hashem Tov. Margala Bapumida, this is from the Morinai, although it's also found in others' farm. Margala Bapumida Harav Bal Shemtov Nishmasu begins in Roman. A pearl, a gem, that was frequently found inside the Bal Shemtov's mouth, a teaching that he would say frequently. Al Mashakasa, what the Pasik says in Devarim, Visartem Vaavaratem Elohim Achirim. It's an unbelievable teaching. You can already see how the Bal Shemtov is going to read this. When you turn away to serve other gods. Said the Baal Shem Tov. That's not how you're supposed to read the Pasuk. When you read the Pasuk, you should read like this. Tekef. Kesheshartem me'es Hashem miyad v'avartem lehim achirim. Vissartem. When a person turns away from Hashem. By definition. You don't have to be bowing down to some statue of Yashka or Buddha Khalila to be worshipping Elohim Achirim. All you need to do is sartem, to turn away from Hashem for an instant in thought, speech, or action. And already, you're, for, you're worshipping, it's foreign worship, it's avoda zara. It's an avoda, it's an action, an activity, which is foreign. What does a Jew have to do with this? What does the, the nefesh kiss have to do with making a shakshuka? What does the nefesh kiss have to do with sitting in traffic on the Goldemir Highway? Not kesher. Now, again, the whole share is going to be about how to practically make sure that making dinner, folding laundry, shopping, sitting in traffic on the Goldemir Highway become not something which is part of the world of the Sitra Achra, but we can bring it back under Tachas Kanfei Ashchina. But we have to understand that the stakes are high here. What the Alter Rebbe is saying is the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, his grand Rebbe, Visartem. When a Jew turns away in thought, speech, or action away from Hashem, you're worshipping another God. I don't know who you're, ta- who you're worshipping, but this is not Hashem. You're worshipping yourself, you're worshipping some foreign worship, but this is not why Hashem created the world. And similarly, Ashrei Adam, the inverse of that is, praiseworthy is the person who actually lives on that level. Ashrei Adam, lo yechshav Hashem, lo avam. That when the moment that he's not thinking about Hashem, that's considered for him a sin. For most of us, what's considered a sin is when we actively violate one of the 365 losases of the Torah, 
or we passively abstain from f performing or fulfilling one of the 248 positive commandments of the Torah. But if I said Kriyat Shema in the morning, and then I spend the rest of the morning you know, going about my day, but not contextualizing it as part of a net, my creating a, a, a storyline, a narrative, which is so deeply tied up with the Ratzon Hashem, which is so deeply tied up with trying to be kavod to Am Yisrael and kavod to Hashem, which is the whole Ratzon of the creation of the world. For most of us, lo yachshav lo adam, avon, that's not considered a, a sin. But Asher Adam, that when lo yachshav Hashem, lo avon, for him that's a sin. And we have to see how, how, what is, what's the mechanism, how does a person, and I already, I mean, I began this year with really the, with the end, which is obviously tefillah is tefillah. The way to make sure that everything that we're doing in this world is dedicated to Hashem, is making sure that we keep talking to Hashem about everything we're doing. Rabbi Shalom, you, you created me in this world. You want me to make a parnasa for my family. You don't want my children walking around or me walking around in stained clothing. Rabbi Shalom, the Gemara says that a person who walks around, a Talmud Chacham walks around with stained clothing, this, this is not a good thing. And the more a person learns, the more a person knows, the more you're able to see how the Ratzon Hashem is being fulfilled in a simple conversation with a person on the street or riding a bus to work or riding a bus back from work or taking your car into the mechanic to get the brakes changed or any simple activity in the world becomes transformed into a, a divine service when we begin to daven over it, we begin to think about it, we begin to live consciously in, uh, in these day-to-day -day activities. So the Pasuk says, we're talking here about idolatry, worshiping a foreign god. So I want to try to explain two words in a Pasuk. That's what we're going to do for the next little bit. To begin the Pasuk, and then we'll read more back in the Tanya, a Pasuk from the Aser said, that we're all familiar with, Lo lecha Elohim acherim al panai. So most people, if you say to them, Lo or for sure if you say, Lo Elohim acherim, they'll know what you're talking about. You're talking about the second of the Aser Sedivros. You shouldn't have any other gods. People will translate it as, you should not have any. You shall not have any other gods before me. But that's a bad translation. Lo yia Elohim acherim al panai. Al panai. How's it al panai? On my face. So I want to explain what that means. In order to explain what that means, let's go back to the Tanya. The Alter Rebbe in the sixth parak continues, and he says, "Understand that when I say." That when a person is having a thought, kol machshava asher lo la Hashem, this is on the fourth line, kol machshava asher lo la Hashem, heima l'ritzono l'avodaso, anything which is not for the ratzon Hashem, not part of the avoda that Hashem is trying to create the world in order to sustain and fulfill, shezeu perish lashon sitra acher. That's what it means. The other side, when we refer to this nefarious force in creation called the sitra acher, what does that mean? It means nothing more than perish tzad acher sheino tzara kedusha. It is the other side, quite literally. It is the side which is not reinforcing holiness. V'tzad ha-kedusha eina ela, listen to this, V'tzad ha-kedusha eina ela, hashra v'hamshacha mikdusha so shel ha-kadosh baruch Holiness means that the activity that is happening is being drawn from a hashra'a and a hamshacha of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He is drawing forth this activity from Hashem Himself, from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, from the Holy One, blessed be He. Ve'ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu shora ela al davar shebatal etzla. How does one ensure that they are doing something which is an activity which is given the divine signet ring? When they are doing an activity which they find themselves being batal ta Hashem, now, there's, especially when you're reading Chabad Chasidus, Bittel means something very high. Bittel means Bittel B'Metzias. It means you don't exist at all. But let's be simple for a second. When a person is Batel Tashem, that is the guarantee that he is drawing his activity, he is drawing what he's doing from a side of holiness, from Hashem Himself. 
Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, V'ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shora, Hashem does not rest. Hashem will not grant His authority to, to sign off on an activity. Ela al davar shebatal etzlai yisbarach. Hashem does not rest on something unless that thing is batal to Him. Unless the thing nullifies itself before Him. As the Gemara says in Sota on the backside, in the third to last source, Amr of Chista, V'yitem Amar Ukva, Kol Adam Sheyesh Bogasas Haruach, any person who has, who's, Haughty of spirit, it's the Gemara in Sotan Tafheim at Aleph. Amar Kadesh Baruch Hu, Ein Ani Vuhu Yechol Nador Ba'olam. I cannot dwell in the same, as, as they always say in the Western movies, there's not enough room in this town for the both of us. The Kadesh Baruch Hu says, It's either me or it's you. Now, this is not because Hashem is on an ego trip, we're going to explain what this means. But the Kadesh Baruch Hu is saying, I cannot possibly exist because if your whole world is you, if your ego is so large, like we spoke about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that it is the ani, ich bin ish ganav, like we were saying. I'm not a ganav. The story of the Alter Rebbe being sent by the, by the Magid to go to that bris. So he was accused of, I remember the story. Ani, anytime a person says ani, he's going to be forced to say, I am not. I am not. Because the Kurdish Baruch Hu says, I cannot dwell in the world together with this person who is a gasrach. As the Pesach says, Gave enayim v'rachav levav, oso lo uchal. Al tikra oso ela ito. Ito lo uchal. I cannot be with such a person. Now the mystery which we need to develop, and we're going to ex- ask this question more explicitly in three minutes, the question that we really need to develop is, you walk around and you meet people, and we ourselves occasionally are caught up in this ego-driven reality where we are convinced that no, no, I definitely exist, and not only do I exist, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, I'm okay without you, Hashem. Like I, could, I, I got this. I, this is my specialty. This is my job. I'm an expert in this field. I know how to do this, and I don't need your help. I'll, I'll come to Avin Mincha later, but leave the job to me right now. Chas So So how, how is the person living at that time? The Gemara says in Sota, I can, Hashem says, I cannot live in a world with a person. I cannot be simultaneously in a world with a person who has this type of ego. I am either in the driver's seat or I'm not in the car. So how is this person operating? How is this happening? You know what? That's, I said I'm going to do it in three minutes. Let's do it right now. On the back side of the page, I have a teaching from the Ramchal. Ramchal and Derech Hashem. Could he be saying something else here, though? Yeah. Oh, there's... Like very near, it's, you could, it depends how you. It depends how you phrase that, that. It depends how you say out that phrase. It's not that he's saying I can't exist. Like if he's in the world, then I can't be in the world. It's because he's turned away that he's not invited me into the world. Same problem. It's the same problem, but it's not. The difference is it's not Hashem saying. Well, it's not saying Hashem. I'm unable to. If, if the theological statement is bothering you, then for sure, that's, you could say it that way. But it doesn't answer the question of, well, how is this person functioning? How is the, how is the businessman, teacher, car mechanic, how are they doing their job not acknowledging that Hashem is literally the only thing that's keeping him alive and allowing him to do what he's doing? How... how Te- so, meaning, t- technically, technically ha- how, is he still how is it happening? So that we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. So let, let, just to ask the question more explicitly, listen to the words of the Ramcha, which at some point in your life, you heard somebody say this. And until, you, until we learn what we're about to learn over the next few minutes, there's this part of us, you know, the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avos, You have to know what to answer a heretic. My Rebbe, of Moshe Weinberger, often says that Mishnah is not only talking about some guy that uh, sits next to you on the train or on the plane and is asking you, you know, or like your uncle, who, you know, Dama al hashiv l'apikaris means to the little l'apikaris, you know. So there's a, definitely, there's a part of us which is asking this question that we're about to ask. Inin ha-tefilahu. You know what tefilah is? Tefilah, the concept of tefilah, is that Hashem created in the world a certain order of things, according to His supernal wisdom. <laughs> that in order for someone to receive something from Hashem, in order to receive 
any shefa, any outpouring of good in this world from Hashem. Person has to come and request from HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he should receive what he needs. And in accordance with the amount of kavana and his orus and passion that a person puts into his request, so in accordance with that will Hashem grant them this shefa. And if they don't daven, they will not draw forth this shefa. And since Hashem wants to give good to His creations, He therefore instituted this concept called tefillah. Hashem wants to give us good. So He says, ask me for it and I'll give it to you. And so Hashem established that every single day, that we should be able to get breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and the gas should be filled in the car, and we should have heating in the houses and clothing on our back. So therefore Hashem said, I will institute tefillah where you ask for all of your needs, so I'll be able to give it to you. What's the question? No, what's the question? How do people get it when they don't? How do people get it when they don't? <laughs> and how do we get it when we don't daven properly? This is, this is a burning question. Fair question. It's a fair question. <laughs> now listen to this. Let's read it again. I want to read it more carefully this time. Because in the second paragraph, he's going to say it. I'm not going to read the whole thing inside. The second paragraph, but homework. You should read it yourself. I can also sorry to well, what's with the non-Jews. Nachon. Anybody who doesn't. What's Any, with anyone who doesn't ask? Let's read it again. Inyan hatfilahu, the inyan of tefillah, kinei min astarim shesidra chachmel yonahu, that in accordance with the order that Hashem, in His infinite wisdom, established. In order for a creature to receive Shefa from Hashem, Now again, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to point this out, even though it's very subtle, but that word Panav is appearing again. And in accordance with the amount of effort that a person puts into it, they'll be able to draw forth the Shefa. Now, I did it again, I read it over it again. But let's read it one more time. Mekablim shefa mimenu yisbarach. See, when you just read it, and you're not reading carefully, you miss the fact that, and I miss the fact, and we miss the fact that there's a very big difference between a person who gets, but he doesn't get it from Hashem, and a person who gets, and he gets it from the sitra achra, which doesn't mean he's not getting from Hashem. There's not, we don't believe in the concept of some other force. This is not uh, Zoroastrianism. We don't believe that there is a force of evil that the Sitra Achra. We mean what the Alter Rebbe is about to say. Let's read it now in the Alter Rebbe. Sitra Achra perish tzada achra she'enu tzada kedusha ve tzada kedusha enu ela hashrav amshach mikdusha so shal kadosh baruch when a person is mevatel himself to Hashem so then Hashem rests on that activity. And when Hashem is not actively present there because the person was not mevatel himself, and the ikr bittel is tefillah, tefillah is the ultimate act of bittel before Hashem, but there are other ways, we'll talk about those as well. So then, he receives it, it's just that he receives it from the sitra achra. What's referred to in other places as the achorayim, the backside. In Pnimi Satora, in the inner way of studying Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu and Paro are pitted against one another. And this part of the throat right over here is referred to as Moshe Rabbeinu, which is where tefillah comes from. And the back of your neck, which is called the Oref, Ha-Oref is the Osios Paro, the back of your neck, the Achorayim, from where if you speak while you're touching the back of your neck, you won't feel the vibration of your speech because this is the stiff-necked place where you refuse to turn to Hashem. Paro is very wealthy. Paro has the Nile. He doesn't have to worry about it not raining if he doesn't daven properly. The, the primary difference between Egypt and Eretz Yisrael is the fact that in Egypt, like the Nachash HaKadmoni in the Garden of Eden, will have everything he could ever possibly need without having to ask for it. He doesn't have to pray your food will be the dust of the earth. 
which doesn't literally mean that a snake eats dust. dust. It means it'll be as available as the dust of the earth. Like Rav Simcha Bunim once said, not in these words because credit cards didn't exist, that it's like a parent who says to a child, I don't ever want to speak to you ever again. Here's a credit card. Don't call. I'm not interested in having a relationship with you. As opposed to Adam, who got kicked out of Gan Eden and has to work and has to toil and gets stuck and has chasronos and therefore has to turn to Hashem because that's the one where the parent says, listen, I'm not going to give it to you all at once because I want to have the mun being a perfect example. Forty years in the desert where Hashem says, I'm not going to give you, Hashem, could have, what, Hashem couldn't have created some sort of super vitamin that you take one time in 40 years and then in the midbar they never had to eat again. He did it with their clothing. Their clothing just grew with them. They never had to wash their clothing. It just happened. There's no, 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 no effort. With the man, it was every day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you what you need for that day, and you learn to trust in Hashem, and you learn to ask Hashem for what you need. And the joke is on you if you don't ask, because you might get it anyway. It's just that you're not getting it from Hashem. You're getting it from the Achorayim. What the Alter Rebbe describes in Parak 22 of Tanya, which we have a ways to go to get there, he says, it's like a mushal of, when somebody loves you and they invite you for a meal, you know, they, they serve you and they sit with you and they talk to you, when they're not really interested in you, they chuck it behind them like scraps for the dogs. That's called achorayim. Achorayim. So the Pasuk says, the Pasuk says, in Tehillim, Perak Koflamites, achor v'kadam tsartani. And now we're going to begin to understand something very profound, really life-changing. Achor v'kadam tsartani. Hashem, you created me backwards and forwards. Achor v'kadam tsartani. This Pasuk in Tehillim is used to explain many different things, including the fact that Adam Rishon was a Siamese twin with Chava in the beginning. Achor v'kadam, you created me backwards and forwards. There were two, there's a two-faced individual in the beginning until Hashem did the mysterious thing called the Nesira, where he split us in half on Rosh Hashanah and brought Chava and Adam together as a symbol of the fact that man also comes from the Rabbon Shalom as one entity and then has to turn back to Hashem. Achor <coughs> v'kadam tsartani means that there are two ways that Hashem offers our existence. One is achor, which is a very tragic way of living, where we receive everything from Hashem, but without recognizing that we're receiving it from Hashem, which is called receiving it from the sitra achor, from the other side. Because every time we receive something from Hashem without recognizing or taking an active step to be mavatal ourselves to Hashem, to recognize that everything we have comes from Hashem, that just further distances us from Hashem. In the words of Chazal, mitzvah, goreres, mitzvah, schar, mitzvah, mitzvah, right? When you, have, when you do a mitzvah, that increases. What that means is, when a person activates a certain consciousness of Hashem in the world, and they engage that consciousness, it fosters further relationship with Hashem, which in turn fosters further relationship with Hashem, as opposed to someone who takes from Hashem's gifts without recognizing it as Hashem, that itself is the punishment. That itself is the punishment. And let's explain why. In light of the Tanya's paradigm that we have a godly soul and we have a nefesh of Bahamas. Achor v'kadim tzartani. Says the Medjish Rabbah, Vayik Rabbah Yudalit Aleph. Listen to this. Imzacha Adam. What does it mean, achor v'kadim tzartani? Imzacha Adam. If a person merits. Again, this is the Medjish talking about this Pasuk and Tehillim. Imzacha Adam. If a person merits. Omrim lo. They say to him, Ata kadam tel kol you came before anything else in creation. You are like the primary purpose of creation. You are the first cause of creation. V'imlav, but if the person does not merit, based on his thought, speech, and action, because he's dipping too much into the side, the side of the sitra achra, then they say to him, Yitush kadamecha, a, 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 a fly, a, a mosquito came before you. You were created on the sixth day. So which was it? Was man created on the first, at the first moment? Or was man created at the last moment after everything else in creation? The animals were created before him. And he's like, oh yeah, we also should create man. So the Shemi Shmuel explains, Achar Vukadam Tzartani means that on the first day of creation, Bereish is Baralukim Esa Shemayim Ve'esaretz. On the first day of creation, when Hashem first decided to create the world, the concept of the Neshama was created on the first day. The body was created on the sixth day. And then afterwards, Hashem took the neshama from the first day and blew it into Adam on the sixth day. 
if you're Zoche, if you choose, read the words, they're so beautiful. Man is both the last thing in creation, an afterthought of creation, totally irrelevant in the scheme of everything else in creation, and at the same time, is literally the purpose of creation, he is before anything else. Because the soul was created on the first day, and the body was created on the last day. If a person merits, and the body becomes secondary to the pursuit of the soul, he is not completely self-consumed. They say to him, You are the first thing because, look, you identify with the soulfulness of you, which was created on the first day. As opposed to if your whole life is about your body and your nefesh, nasis tafel aguf and your body becomes the primary expression of your being, and your soul takes a back seat all the time, and occasionally you'll throw the soul a bone, and say, I'll dive in a little something, I'll, you know, I'll give a little charity. A mosquito came before you because you're all about the body, and the body was the last thing that was created in creation. That means to say that a person who lives panim, kadam, you understand, panim is the same thing as kadam. Achor ve kadam is the same thing as panim and achor. Achor ve kadam tzartani means you were created as achor, as a guf, and kadam, the first thing in creation, as an nefesh. If you choose to live on the panim of creation, where you want to have a face-to-face relationship with Hashem, where everything we do is aiming to be Ashre Adam Lo Yechshav Hashem, that when I don't think about Hashem in something, Lo Avon, that is considered a sin. So then we are living an existence of Panim. We're existing on a level of face to face relationship with Hashem. If we choose to turn our back on Hashem and we choose to live Achorayim with Hashem, we'll continue to thrive and to live until such a time comes that Hashem decides that we don't anymore. But it's not as if the way that Hashem is manhig the world is that when a person recognizes Hashem, he's okay, and when he doesn't, he drops dead. It's rather that when a person recognizes Hashem, he receives it from Hashem. And the difference between receiving it from Hashem is that it furthers, again, when you receive it from Hashem, that means you're receiving it panim, that means it continues to foster the nefesh kiss. Your consciousness becomes more enmeshed with a divine way of looking at the world. And if you so choose, if we so choose to live with Achorayim, the very punishment is that we become more consumed and enslaved by the animal side. We become more confused and start to think that this world is about physicality, which always leaves us, always leaves us feeling empty. It always leaves us with a search for meaning. Kedusha, to a certain degree, holiness means, one of, one of, the, uh, one of my, my employees, uh, one of my employers in, uh, in Araita, one of the Rosh Yeshiva, always likes to say that we speak about Kedusha as holiness, or Rabbi David Aaron, he likes to make puns like this, that he always says we speak of holiness as, you know, H-O-L-Y, holy. He said when we really should be talking about Kedusha as whole, as a certain shlemus, a person feels whole. When a person chooses to live achurayim, that's the punishment itself. When you don't receive it from Hashem, there's, you never have enough. There's never enough. I have half, always, if that. Maybe I have a quarter, maybe less than that. But when a person lives holy, meaning connected to the panim of Hashem, then there's something special about the one who gave me. What, it's not just what I got, but it's who gave it to me. Sometimes you can receive something... <coughs> And it's not the gift itself which is so remarkable, but it's the person who gave it to you that makes you feel good. When a person is living panim, kadam, when a person is living with a face-to-face relationship with Hashem, so then every gift becomes a worthwhile gift, and I always have exactly what I need because I trust the relationship that I have with Hashem, panim el panim. The famous story about Rav Zusha. Rav Zusha used to have one of his um, attendants come and bring him uh, breakfast every morning. After the evening, he would go sit down in his house, and Rav Zusha would sit at the table, and this is how it went. The attendant would wait outside, and Rav Zusha would say, Rav Shel Olam, Zusha is so hungry. Oh, Rav Shel Olam, Zusha is so hungry. And just at that moment, what do you know? The attendant would walk in 
with a, you know, with a nice breakfast meal. And Zusha would say, wow, Rabbi Shalom, thank you so much for taking care of Zusha. So one day this attendant said, you know, well, come on, this, this is ridiculous. He said, you know what, today I'm not going to walk in. Let the Rebbe of Zusha sit and he'll ask Hashem, I'm not going to walk in. Mm-hmm. So, after davening, the Rebbe of Zusha took off his talisman tefillin, he went, sat down at the table. He said, oh, Rebbe of Shalom, is so hungry. Here's the ticking of the clock, nothing's happening. Rebbe of Shalom, is so hungry. And just then, there's a little knock on the window on the side. And this uh, Jewish woman comes over and says, you know, there was a bris in the shul across town. We had some extra bagels, you, you know. And the, the attendant said, I thought, I thought it that it was me. Mm-hmm. But the Rebbe Rizushan knew it was Hashem the whole time. It looked like I was the one who was bringing it. And the Rebbe Rizushan knew that I was the one who was bringing it. But never for a second did the Rebbe Rizushan lose sight of the fact that I am receiving this from Hashem. This is not Achorayim. I'm not getting this as like some... This is from Hashem. And if you don't bring it, I'll get it some other way. If you don't bring it, I'll get it some other way. And if I don't get it, then Hashem is not giving it to me. And if Hashem's not giving it to me, then I could be besimcha with the fact that Hashem's not giving it to me. But a person who thinks that he's getting it himself or someone else is giving it to him, his boss is giving it to him, or his wife is the one who looks at him and gives him the proper respect that he thinks that he deserves, or his kids are behaving at the Shabbos table or not behaving at the Shabbos table. If, it's, if everything's coming from my kids or my wife or my boss or my employees, you know, and they're not, I pay them to do a certain job and I feel like they're not, you know, they're leaving early, or whatever a person's situation is. When you think that it's someone else who's giving it to you, you're always on the losing end. Achurayim is an automatic loss. But when a person lives kadim, when a person lives with panim, then he's receiving from Hashem by dint of the fact that he is mevatel himself to Hashem, he receives from Hashem. There's no greater joy than that. Everything he does starts to be from Hashem. It, it's impo- for that person, Asher Adam, lo yachshav Hashem, lo avon. That he recognizes that the breakfast that he gets is from Hashem, the deal that went through is from Hashem, the good class that he gave is from Hashem. Everything is from Hashem. Shivisi Hashem tamid. And that's one person going back to our Shaveh. Everything comes from Hashem, everything's Shaveh. That's called living Panim, it's called living forward. The Torah says you can't, no man can live if, if they see my face. You can't see my face and live. The Torah says it explicitly. You're, say, you're saying that as a question? As a, as a question. He's, he, he's pointing out, you cannot see my face and live. I think that's true. Meaning, part of being in the world of Hester Panim is that uh, there has never been a human being, even Moshe Rabbeinu, who that statement is addressed to, mm-hmm. who was so perfectly enmeshed with, this is all coming from Hashem, there has never been a human being who, until Mashiach comes, there has never been a human being who had so deeply been enrooted in Panim, even Moshe Rabbeinu who spoke Panim be Panim, mm-hmm. there were times, yes, but there were times when even Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't speaking to Hashem, Panim be Panim. For 40 years in the Midbar, Hashem did not use the word Dibor because He wasn't speaking to Moshe Rabbeinu on that level. But it's weird that it uses the same language that we're talking about. And, he, and Hashem also pointed that you will only see my back. I think this is... Hashem is pointing out very, very, very much, you know, Asher Adam lo yachshav Hashem lo avon means that every human being, even the person who we say about him, Ashrei Adam, praiseworthy is this, whoa, look at this tzaddik, oh. tzaddik Yisrael Olam, still, there are going to be times when lo yachshav Hashem, and that will be lo avon, that will be a sin for him. It's a guarantee. A person cannot completely, as the, the early philosophers said, ilu yadativ hayativ. If I, was, if I knew Hashem so deeply, I would be Hashem. They're by definition, by the fact that we exist in in olam, milashon ha'elam, in a world of hiddenness, we automatically are striving towards a perfection which we'll never reach. But lo alecha hamalacha ligmor. We don't have to finish the job. We just have to be constantly digging deeper and deeper and deeper to uncover the next level of this is all from Hashem, this is all from Hashem, this is all from Hashem. So now we go back to the... Now we go back to the... Um, to the Ramchal for a minute, and then we'll start to finish up. In the second paragraph in Derech Hashem, where he's talking about tefillah, he 
that's where he really gives it away. That's where he gives you the key to understand the first paragraph where he says, to receive it which by the way just to go back to our original question means that there sh- you shall not have any other foreign gods in the sense that any time going back to the other you turn away from Hashem that's serving other gods means that anytime you are not having a panai experience with me, anytime you're not seeing that this is my face-to-face relationship with you, by definition you're having an achorayim type of experience, which is, again, Elohim achirim, Elohim achirim is a lashon not only of otherness, but achirim is achorayim, is you're having this relationship with, you're receiving from me without recognizing that it's from me and that's idolatry that's idolatrous and you're doing it to yourself it's not like I punish you you choose to cut yourself off from this and so you'll always be lacking so this is what the Ramchal says spells out explicitly in Osbez Chelek Dalit of the Sefer Derech Hashem Perakei Osbez V'amnam Omek Yosr Yesh Benyin in other words now let me spell this out for you more deeply what I just said to you in Os Aleph, that the Indian tefillah is to be able to be Mekavlam Shefami Menu Yisbarach, who, Ki Hineha Adon Baruch Unosin Adam Deyali Hios Manig Atzma Vaulama Besechel Betuna. Hashem gave the human being the ability, He gave human beings the ingenuity to, to go in the world and to do things and to understand the world and to make scientific discoveries and technological advances. Va'amim Hamasa Alav Lios Mipakech Alza, and He gave to him the wherewithal. To be mipakech, atzrachav, kulam, to to fend for himself and to hunt and to gather and to in a more modern time to shop and to you know and to have to be able to pay the bills. This Hashem gave us this al shnei shrashim ha'echad likro shem ha'adam v'chashivuso because Hakadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give man a certain chashivus that he should be self sufficient. That he should be able to take good care of himself. They shouldn't be dependent all the time. And also, meaning Hashem did it for man, that man should be able to take care of himself, enjoy the world, Hashem wants us to enjoy. And also because Hashem wants us to elevate the world. He wants us to be osik in the world, to fix it, and to be metak in the world. Hashem wants us to be involved in the whole of the world, in the mundane of the world, and not in only in the overtly holy. And this is exactly the way that Hashem wanted it, in Olam Haza, to prepare for Olam Haba, by being attacking the world, and enjoying the world. The goal of sending man down into this physical world is ultimately to lift him up. And therefore, you know why you have to have tefillah? Listen to the, this, this next two lines we're about to read. is unbelievable. It is true that man needs to be down here in the physical world because Hashem wants man to fix the physical world. The danger of being down here in the physical world, though, is that a person gets carried away with the physical world. A person should not become consumed by the physical world, to get so confused by the physical world that he begins to look at himself as if I'm a body that happens to have a soul, as opposed to a soul that happens to have a body. Because the more that a person entwines himself and begins to be, you know, moving around within the physical world, he becomes more darkened and moves away from the light of, of uh, this divine, the supernal light that Hashem is offering him, of spirituality. So you know what? Hashem gave us a tikkun. You know how to ensure that we're not receiving everything from the Achorayim. Hashem gave us a tikkun. And we need to cut this out and paste it on the walls of our house. 
That every time a person is about to engage in this physical world, Hashem, before I engage in any action in the world, I need to throw myself upon you. I need to ask that it should come from you and not from me or not from some other side. This is the beginning and the underlying principle which comes before any action, any activity, any hishtadlus that I make in the world. So that afterwards, when I go and turn on the flame, when I go and press the button on the laundry machine, when I go and ask my boss for the raise, when I go and try to cut that deal, I try to edit that movie, I try to, whatever I'm doing, anything that I'm doing is after tefillah, that's a guarantee that that hishtadlus that I make afterwards will not be mistakenly seen as something which is coming from my own. And what happens if I don't ask from Hashem? So now we're in our 30s and 40s and we're not thinking like children anymore. And we realize that if I don't ask for it, guess what? I might still succeed. Hashem will decide whether I succeed or not, independent of my tefillah. But the problem is that even if I succeed by the world standards of succeeding, mm-hmm. even if I make the, I make the grade, right. even if I make the deal, even if I, the laundry comes out perfectly clean, mm-hmm. I failed if it comes from Achorayim, because I'll always be lacking essential meaning in my life. Because I was created Achor Vekadam. I was created backwards and I was created forwards. And I have to choose whether I choose to live a life where it's coming from Hashem or I cut myself off from Hashem, is not to say that I will succeed or not succeed by the world standards of success. But the world standards of success are not true. Because at least, Baruch Hashem and Eretz Yisrael don't have to worry about these things. You can go to the supermarket and buy you know, your groceries and in the checkout lane you don't have to sit and see tabloids. You know, as you're like, I don't know if they have this in... Uh, but in America, when I was a young kid, I used to go with my parents, you know, they'd take me, put me in the thing. So you get to the checkout, I mean, I'm talking really young. So you're sitting in like the thing and you get to the checkout line and there's, you know, this multimillionaire's, you know, splitting up with his, you know, and this one's kids hates him and this one was suicidal and this one's, because it's all coming from Acharayim. It's all coming from Acharayim. And when a person receives from Ponim, when Reb Zusha says, Ay, Reb Zusha is so hungry. Reb Zusha knows that whether or not the Shamish comes out, he has exactly what he needs. And whether or not the lady comes with the bris bagels, he has exactly what he needs because it's coming straight from Hashem. It's coming straight from Hashem. This is an unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievably difficult thing to do. There's a story, since we're learning Tanya, this is the sixth parak, this is what the sixth parak is really all about. Since we're learning Tanya, I guess we'll end. What time is it? Mm-hmm. So we'll end, even though there's, there's more to say. But we'll end with a, with a Maisa. One of the uh, early Hasidim of the Alter Rebbe was someone named Reb Pesach. There's, there's even Nagunim, he, he was a big Balmanagin, a big Amkan in learning. And uh, Reb Pesach was one of the Hasidim of the Alter Rebbe, later, uh, some of the later Rebbe's of Chabad. And uh, he was always thinking in Avoda. One time Reb Pesach went to a Fabrengen. And uh, on the way back from Fabrengen, it was very late at night, and this Rav Pesach was walking back to his house. And as he's walking down the street, you know, some Russian uh, guard sees some, you know, after curfew, it was a late night, Fabrengen went late, and Rav Pesach is thinking about the, the Fabrengen, and, you know, the Rebbe had just given this whole big mimer about bittel hayesh and nullifying oneself before Hashem, a big theme in the Alter Rebbe's writings. And he's walking down the street and this guard says, you know, who, who is that? Who's, who, you know, show me your, who, who are you? So he said, garnished, nothing, it's nobody. So he said, don't be smart with me, you know, tell me who you are or I'm going to lock you up in jail. So he says, bottle, nothing, there's not, nothing, there's not, not much nothing. So this, so this Russian officer takes out his club and he starts beating this, uh, he starts beating this Yid until he like, just like passes out from like, you know. And he comes to and he like wanders back to his house and he like crawls into the house beaten and bruised. And he walks into the house and his wife looks at him 
And he says, Pesach, what happened to you? What happened? He says, there was nothing walking down the street and nothing came and it hit him with nothing. But boy, did it hurt. <laughs> boy, did it hurt. There was nothing that was walking down the street and nothing came and nothing hit him. But Mama should hurt so much. This is the answer to your question. You can't see... It hurts. We live in a world where the ego is there, the I is there. We live in that world. It's, it's, it's part of our reality. I am going shopping. I am making dinner. I am eating dinner. I am purchasing new clothing. I am the chulu, everything in the world. I am giving a shir. I am listening to a shir. I am recording a shir. I am listening to a shir that was recorded before. Everything is I, I, I. And we feel it. But to live with that reality that this Reb Pesach was able to live with, that even though it hurts and even though I recognize myself and I can't escape myself entirely, it's not possible in this world, nonetheless, to be able to say in an intellectual way, to use the faculties of Chachma, Bina, and Das, to recognize that there needs to be a bitl before Hashem so that I could still say the words and I could dive in the words that a nothing came and hit a nothing with a nothing. Not some Russian officer came and hit me with his stick. Mm -hmm. Nothing came and hit nothing with a nothing. Because really all there is is Enon Movado, all there is is Hashem. And even though, boy, did it hurt. Uh, boy, did I succeed. Boy, did I accomplish something. And I'm proud of myself. But at the same time, to be able to live in that dichotomy of, I know I can't escape myself. I'm not going to delude myself and think I'm walking out as a tzaddik who doesn't recognize that it's, I think it's me who's doing things. I feel myself, I experience myself. It doesn't mean that we can't train ourselves to think and slowly move ourselves in the direction of being able to say, that Hashem will fill the world with knowledge of God so, so, so strong that we won't have to look to see where is Hashem, but we'll be able to see Hashem right before our eyes Panim b'panim, that a Kaddish Baruch won't just speak to Moshe Rabbeinu, panim b'panim, but every single Jew will be able to speak to Hashem, panim b'panim, with the Gula Shlema of Amitas Meher Amen. 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 Amen.